exactly do you think has been wrong or missing from Clubhouse, Twitter Spaces, and other um, podcast platforms out there? Well, they're all ephemeral, Emily. So when you create a room on any of those platforms that you mentioned, it's it, it it's not saved. It's, it gets thrown out. And that was really the starting point for understanding what we're doing is that we're creating a form of podcasting. When you go on call-in, it's really like recording a pod in front of a live studio audience. You do have the ability to take questions from the audience, but you have a creator, you have a show, they're in charge of the room, they can bring people up single file to ask their questions. And then, you know, very importantly, after they record the episode, and every room is recorded by default, uh, you can go into the post-production features, you can edit the episode, you can cut out anything you don't like, and then you can publish and share it, and it becomes part of our backlog. So it's very different. There's a library here, it's podcasting, but it's a new kind of social podcasting. And that's the reason we don't actually think the space is, is that crowded. Yeah, there's about five other companies doing the same thing, but they're not doing what we're doing, which is social podcasting. Right, you're weaving in some old school radio features like a cue for audience participation. I, I'm curious, are you putting podcast producers out of a job with this or are there some <laughs> things that the platform still can't do? Well, we're, we're still doing a podcast with, with All In. You know, it's the podcast I've been doing with a few friends for a year and a half. And that's what kind of inspired me to, to do this is that I learned how difficult regular podcasting is. You know, we have a guy in the sound studio, an engineer who does six hours of post-production on every episode. With Colin, you don't have to do that. We just automate all, away all of that work. But our goal is not to win some, you know, small sliver of the existing podcasting market. Our goal is to grow that market exponentially 10x, 100x, maybe even 1000x by enabling the long tail of podcasting, enabling anyone who has something to say to create a show. And now they can do that with just their iPhone. They don't need to have a, you know, a sound studio or an engineer. They can just get started using an app. And that's really the, the breakthrough here is bringing podcasting to anybody who wants to create a show. Well, speaking of breakthrough, creators are expecting a lot more from social platforms these days. Are you gonna pay individual show creators? How will you decide how much to pay them and when? Yeah, so I think, you know, we haven't introduced a business model yet, but I think the, the two sort of obvious ideas that have worked in other contexts are advertising and subscriptions. And so, you know, the, the, the sort of tried and true playbook on this is first you build a mass audience, then you introduce monetization. So, but our plan would be to share with the creators. I think it would be much more of a YouTube like philosophy than a Facebook-like philosophy, which is whether the business model ultimately ends up being advertising or subscriptions, there would be a very healthy rev share with the creators as opposed to you know Facebook, which keeps all the revenue. Hmm. Okay. What do you think about Clubhouse these days? I mean, I've heard people go so far as to say Clubhouse is dead. Would you agree or dying? Well, I, you know, I just think they have a very different kind of vision. I've heard the founder talk about what he's trying to do, and the vision is very much around creating these live experiences. Um, it's almost like uh, a digital cocktail party, you know? And I think there is definitely a place in the world for those kinds of experiences. It's a new kind of, you know, social experience. Um, it's almost like a digital party line or something like that. I think that's great. Uh, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think we're trying to do something very different which is, again, we're trying to create shows. And, you know, when you go on call-in, you're not just going into a, a room where there's a many-to-many -many conversation. You're going into a room where there's a specific creator who has a goal in mind. They have a very specific concept to show in mind, and they're trying to produce episodes of that. And so when you go in with a different intent, uh, there's also a very different culture and expectation in the app. And so really, we're just trying to create something different, I think, than Clubhouse, not try to do the same thing. And in a post-pandemic world when, look, at some point people, you know, are going to go back to the office, uh, they're not necessarily going to be on lockdown, not facing these restrictions, what do you think is the future of audio and social audio in general as a piece of the media pie? How much bigger does that yeah. piece get? I think it can get a lot bigger. You know, I actually think audio could even be bigger than, long tail audio could be bigger than YouTube for the simple reason that it's so easy to create. Um, you know, video has gotten easier to create, but the thing about video is that, you know, video can be very compelling if it's good, but if it's not good, it's actually a worse experience. Like bad video is much worse than no video. And the reality is that the microphone on the iPhone has now gotten so good. It's kind of like the camera that you can create uh, podcast quality audio just using your phone. And it's so easy that I think we could see 
you know, we could see um, audio be the biggest user generated content category. I think we're just still just scratching the surface. And the reason why people haven't thought about it that way until now is just because doing a podcast was very hard. You know, you had to have the, you know, the post-production facility to do it. So I think this could be a very, very big category of user generated content. All right. Meantime, speaking of the pandemic, you are a big proponent of the recall of California Governor Gavin Newsom. At one point, you were supporting your, your bestie, as you call him, Chamath Palihapitiya, <laughs> another investor. Uh, he pulled yeah. out. Why do you think Newsom is so bad for California, and who do you support to replace him? Well, um, you know, I was on your show six months ago, and we talked about this. Um, you know, I think that we have an opportunity here with the recall to send a message to the political class that runs California. I mean, the reality is that California is pretty much a single-party state, uh, and it's run by an entrenched political elite. And I don't think most people in California are super, super happy with the way it's going. We've seen crime is out of control, homelessness is out of control. Uh, school closures were the, the most severe uh, during COVID of any state in the country, uh, we were the 50th state in learning loss, meaning we had the most learning loss among our children, which affects disadvantaged kids the most. Um, we also had the most severe lockdowns in the country, lockdowns on businesses that Gavin Newsom himself did not obey his own rules. That, to me, was the hypocrisy of French, the French laundry thing. Not, not the fact that he was eating at you know, a five-star restaurant or something like that, but the fact that he was breaking his own rules while other businesses were suffering. And so I think these are the issues that Californians are up in arms uh, about. Um, now, at the end of the day, I don't know exactly you know, what happens here. I mean, it was always going to be a long shot to recall a governor who won by 22 points uh, just three years ago and uh, has outraised all of his opponents by something like $70 million. So this was always gonna be a long shot, but I felt it was important to support the recall to draw attention to these issues and the need for California to, to basically send a message to this entrenched right. class. So you support the recall, but who do you support to replace him? I mean, do you, are you supporting a Republican candidate? I haven't, you know, I'm, 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 I'm yes on question one, and I'm leaving it for people to decide for themselves who they want to support on question two. Okay. What I would say is, you know, Newsom is really trying to scaremonger on this issue. I think what people have to keep in mind is that no matter who the replacement governor is, Democrats will still have a majority in the legislature and the assembly. And in fact, they will have a supermajority, which means that the governor, even if the governor vetoed a piece of legislation, that veto could be overridden by the, the legislature. So there's not much that a replacement governor could do. The one thing they could do is keep schools open, is to avoid a repeat of the school closures we had over the past year. I think that would be healthy. But that's about the only thing they could do. And, um, and that's why I think it's really important to use this opportunity to send a message to the political elite uh, by voting yes okay. on question one. So, you know, just, you know, I'm sure you're going to continue this debate on Twitter and on All In. Some would say that it's the teachers union that is really making the decisions about the schools, not necessarily the governor. I'm curious what you think about these big companies, big tech companies, uh, mandating vaccine disclosures. Do you think that's a good thing, that, that that's okay, or does that take um, the power of a corporation too far? I've got just about a minute left. Yeah, well, no, I, so I think private companies should be able to, uh, to impose those requirements on their employees. I mean, I think that if a private enterprise wants to say that, look, in order for people to come back to the office, you have to be vaccinated, I think that is their right as a private enterprise. So I, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, now, but back to the point you made at the beginning of the question, you said that um, it was the teachers unions calling the shots in school closures, not Gavin Newsom. I would just point out that the teachers are Gavin, that the teachers unions are Gavin Newsom's biggest single donor. So yes, the education unions are calling the shots, but okay. they are telling Gavin what to do. And the, and, and the problem I have with him is he does not stand up to these special interests. That is what we need in a governor, someone who's willing to stand up against the entrenched special interests. 